thank you very much. Um, that was very kind and generous of you. Um, there's a lot, you know, when you're an old guy, you've not been a lot of places. So please forgive me. <laughs> for, so, so I, um, <clears throat> pardon me, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you this morning about a subject, <clears throat> pardon me, that um, is very important to me, been a focus of a lot of my work, is a focus of a lot of my work now, licensing behavior analysts. So um, let me see if I can figure out how to uh, share my screen. I, am I set up for that, Wafa, Wafa uh, that I can share my screen? You should be able to, let me double check. Okay. Yes, Dr. Borland, you can share your screen. I, 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 I think I found it. Yes. Okay, now Perfect. let me get this right. Um, okay, so um, what's all this I hear about licensing behavior analysts? This is a brief review. And um, I'm gonna tell you up front, I am um, gonna cover a lot of information, <coughs> pardon me, very fast. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, and then um, if we have time at the end, Maybe you'll probably have questions. Uh, I'll also present at the end my uh, uh, an email address where you can contact me if you wish. Uh, Wafa and uh, uh, Lamas have, have also have my contact information. So um, that said, let's forge ahead here. So I'm coming to you from deep in the heart of Texas. Um, it's almost sunrise here. Uh, so we're a little behind you guys. Um, so that's a stylized map of the state of Texas. There really is, are other places around it. Oklahoma, state of Oklahoma to the north, state of New Mexico to the west, state of Louisiana to the east and south and is the nation of, Me of Mexico. Um, so that's where I am. Uh, and here's some disclaimers um, that I have to say that the opinions expressed here are, the, are, are mine. They're not necessarily those of any organization with which I'm associated and I have no known uh, conflict of interest relevant to this presentation. So here's some objectives. Um, there's seven of them. Uh, I realize that's a lot. Uh, just trying to reflect a lot of the information we'll be um, trying to work through very quickly this morning. Reasons for professional credentials, types of professional credentials, um, characteristics of an occupational, li of occupational licensure, some criticisms of occupational licensure because behavior analyst license Licensing is, um, what in the U.S. anyway, is considered uh, an occupational license. You state the difference between behavior analysis certification and behavior analyst licensure, and then talk about what I call some components of the ground game uh, in moving toward licensure. So with that, um, some of you may know of a character in a um, comedy show in, in Saturday Night Live here in the U.S. And Emily, the character was called Emily Lytella. And she'd come on the, what, the simulated newscast and say, what's all this I hear? And so in her voice, like, what's all this I hear about lying, sinning behavior analyst? Because she always misunderstood some of the words. And the uh, newscaster would come back and say, no, Emily, that's licensing behavior analyst. So <clears throat> today we want to talk about licensing behavior analysts. What... Uh, What's that all about? Well, as you all know, there's all kinds of licenses. You got driver's license, you got license plates on our cars, business licenses, software licenses, um, copyright license, business licenses. I think I had that before. Uh, taxi licenses, nursing licenses, medical license, psychology license, all kinds. So what is a license? Well, here's some definitions. This is uh, from the Cambridge Dictionary. Um, a license pardon me, is something, uh, is an official document from a government, court, et cetera, some governmental agency that gives you permission to do, have, or own something. So it's a governmental action. So all the uh, supplementary uh, information there, an official a license is an official document that gives you permission to do, own, or use something, usually after you've paid money or taken a test. There's some criteria here, some qualifications. So in brief, that's what a license is very broadly and just in general. It's again, a government, typically a governmental um, act giving you permission, official permission, government sanction 
to do something and you have to present some criteria to obtain it. That's very broad. So I want to focus on a particular notion that the last three of the examples I gave, uh, nursing license, medical license, psychology license, those are what's called an occupational license. They have to do with the occupation. They're a little different category from those others above. So what's an occupational license? And I know this must be very authoritative because I, I borrowed it from Wikipedia. So, um, but I think it's actually okay. Um, an occupational license is said to have the strongest public support uh, for activities whose, and this is important, whose incompetent execution or incompetent performance would be a health or safety threat to the public, such as practicing medicine. Okay, so this is, introduces some very important information and ideas that when an occupation or profession is licensed, it um, indicates that there's some strong support behind it, but it's, again, typically used when, if that profession or that occupation were performed incompetently or poorly, there would be health or safety risks or threats to the public. And I think you can see quickly how this ties into licensure behavior analyst. So then to go on a bit more about it, um, <clears throat> pardon me, it, um, restricting the entry by li li using licensure to, to restrict entry into a profession is sometimes considered a, a convenient and effective means for maintaining the high status, the high standards, excuse me, high status and elite privileges of a license of a profession as well as, and this is again important, acting to eliminate competition from those who provide a cheaper, allegedly. This is one of the criticisms some people make, but it's, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it's trying to help maintain high standards of a profession. So there's two general types of occupational license. One's called a title license, or title, and these are in the US are called a title act or a practice act. Here's the difference or here's what they are. A title act restricts who can use a professional title. In other words, there is a law or some governmental um, uh, statement, rule, that says only certain people can hold or can claim to be a licensed psychologist, a licensed dentist, um, a licensed behavior analyst. Okay, If you don't hold that license, you cannot claim to do that. Okay. So that's a title act it has to do with what you call yourself. Then a practice act restricts who can actually engage in those activities of a profession, uh, regardless of what you call yourself, who can practice medicine, I'm supposed to say who, not how, who can pull teeth and treat cavities, who can provide professional services, who can provide behavior analysis services. So an important note is, is that a often a licensing law for a profession incorporates both components of occupational licensure, a title act and a practice act. So it says <clears throat> if you had a, um, a licensing uh, law regarding behavior analysis, it would say who could use the title, licensed behavior analyst, and it would say who can do behavior analysis in that jurisdiction. <clears throat> so there's clearly there's some controversy about all this. What's all the fuss about? Well, before we go to that, let's talk about some of the different kinds of professional credentials. Um, there's, you know, roughly four, there's mix, mixtures of these, registration of a, in a profession, certificate, being a certif having a certificate of some sort, having certification, which is different from just having some kind of a certificate, perhaps, and licensure. And again, what's the point of all these? This is to try to basically let people know um, something about the holder of the credential, that they have some training or allegedly have some expertise or some knowledge or some skill uh, in the particular area. So let's kind of go through these quickly. What is registration? Um, this is where some basically a, re a registration is where someone can register their name address qualifications with some some regulatory body or some more broadly some group and presumably it implies a some standard for being on the list but and and maybe someone complains about someone who is registered 
on the list, like a supposed, like a, a registered behavior therapist or a registered behavior analyst, and maybe they can be removed from the list. But the bottom line is, generally speaking, there's no, if someone says they're on the list and they perform incompetently or do something really uh, dangerous or bad, um, <clears throat> there's probably little that can be done um, other than take their name off the list and they may say, and I've seen this happen, eh, so what, who cares? Um, here in Texas, where I am, before we had licensure, before we had certification, so you know this is way back in the old days, um, we, uh, the Texas Association for Behavior Analysis was concerned about who's running around doing behavior analysis and advertising themselves to the public. So we started a, a registry of behavior analysts, and to get on the list, you had to um, indicate you'd received some training in behavior analysis and that you would follow, uh, comply with uh, some ethical statements. Now, the BACB didn't even exist then, so we had our own ethical statements that we had generated. So people had to agree with that. But if someone said they were on the list, but they weren't, we couldn't do anything about it. Someone that was on the list did something really bad. Um, there was no enforcement mechanism. So next is the certificate. It's basically, it's a document. All the certificate is, is a document uh, containing some kind of a statement saying that something is true. Our, so suppose it might look like this. Obviously, this is a simulation. It's made up. This is not real. But people do this. People hold workshops. I've done workshops, and people who attend them get a certificate at the end saying you attended whatever, ABCs of ABA, by presented by Dr. FR Schedule, um, and tells when it was, how long it was. Um, and people hang that on the wall and think, well, that's interesting. Um, uh, sometimes people who are not well-trained and don't have maybe not uh, lacking in scruples, I'll present that and say, see, I'm, I'm qualified. I went to Dr. Schedule's um, workshop, or I went to Dr. Borland's workshop, have had that happen. So credential, uh, a certificate just means you, generally speaking, done something. Now, sometimes there's some overlap with some of these other things. So um, let's move on. So certification. Now here, the US, there's a uh, report, there's statements by the U.S. government, so I'm going to rely on that. Um, but it's certification is a process in which a non notice this non governmental organization grants recognition to an individual who has met predetermined qualifications specified by that organization. So it's a process, often voluntary. In fact, it typically is voluntary unless there's some um, rule to the contrary or law uh, in some jurisdiction. But it's a process by which individuals who have documented the level of skill, knowledge, knowledge and skill required for a profession or occupation are identified to the public stakeholders. So three important correct features about certification. It's voluntary. It's by a non-governmental organization, typically speaking. Now, again, in some jurisdictions, there's some um, overlap of, of um, terminology here, but typically certification is voluntary. It's from a non-governmental organization. And it's intended, what's the purpose? It's intended to let the public know who's completed uh, by the, some education training requirements and supposedly demonstrated certain level of performance. But it's typically speaking, not it's voluntary. You can be a member of this profession and not have it. You can, um, you know, and often it's not governmental regulated. So there's some limitations. We'll come back to some of these notions in a moment. So a certificate might look like this. And this again is something I just made up. I tried to use some odd looking things in it so maybe no one would mistake that it might be real but so it might look like that there's the name of the certifying entity the name of the person i'm a behaviorist um search satisfied all criteria established by the pan galactic consortium of behavior analysis credentials um doesn't exist in case you're wondering um and saying that uh Ms. Behaviorist is a certified behavior analyst, a pan galactic certified behavior analyst. And there's her certificate number and some figures, I don't know what symbols, I don't know what they are, and so on and so forth. It's signed by Dr. F.I. Schedule, uh, who's the grand potentate of the pan galactic consortium of behavior analysis credentials. Obviously, that's made up. But so now there's a little something here. Um, there's more uh, regulation with a certain certification this is a sort of i guess a certificate but it goes beyond it's a certification that some entity non-governmental entity has said this person has these credentials and uh someone who claims to have those credentials and doesn't can 
There can be uh, legal action saying you've got to cease and desist doing that. But a person can still run around and do behavior analysis, even if their certification is re revoked. That's happened in the US, uh, happened here in the state of Texas where I live. People had been certified by the BC BACB uh, for a variety of reasons. Their cert certificate was revoked. They were no longer certified behavior B BCBAs. And they just kept on advertising that they were behavior analysts. They just couldn't say that they were uh, board certified. So moving on. So then there's um, licensure. And this is the crux of what we're really going to talk about today. So again, according to a US government report that was uh, generated at the request of Congress, heard me, the um, uh, licensure is intended to, I mean, this is important, protect the public. It's exclusionary. It says some can, some can't engage in certain activities, use certain names. Uh, it prescribes the characteristics and qualifications of a person who's licensed. So it's, it's selective. It's exclusionary. Some people won't meet those criteria. It defines a scope of practice. And this is very important um, in behavior analyst licensure, scope of practice. What behavior analysis involved? What does psychology involve? What's their scope of practice? What's the scope of practice of a speech and language therapist? Uh, so PRAC talks about the scope of practice. It's Practice Act. Uh, it prohibits non-licensed persons from engaging in the defined practice uh, of the profession. And generally, the criteria are specified for what you have to, uh, the characteristics for entering the profession or becoming licensed, and then what you have to do to maintain licensure. So a license might look something like this. It's a little different. Again, this is completely made up. Um, but so you have, it says, so uh, I'm a B behaviorist, it's license number, whatever that is. Person named above's license as a behavior analyst by the Kepler 452B uh, Board of Behavior Analyst. Um, and then it's got some made up stuff down there. But so it is issued a certain date, it expires a certain date, it's signed by somebody who has authority to do this. And this then is a um, license sure from this in this made up case of some planetary government but it's a governmental it's supposed simulated governmental entity and this is more enforceable than just a cert than certification or certificate or registration so now there's some criticisms of, of professional licensure um and and i've heard some of this in giving testimony at various committees and legislative entities uh a, li a license keeps people from doing whatever they want to do, uh, prevents people from um, with certain skills from using them if they're not licensed, uh, restricts the supply of possible service providers in a profession, or and it limits the supply, making services more expensive, especially uh, when there's demand for particular services. Um, this is this is a big criticism that some people have. Again, I've encountered this in giving testimony. I say, well, that's just you're just trying to protect your guild, your, your group, your, your profession, and it's so you can keep your prices up. Um, we'll come back to these. It limits access to services. Well, if only a few licensed people can provide services, well then there's not gonna be a whole lot of people available to provide services. Um, and there's good, good answers to that. Increases the size of government here in the state of Texas. That's a big deal. A lot of places in the United States say we might, don't like big government, so. And it increases governmental regulation. Some people really uh, don't like that. Uh, there's a well-known economist, Milton Friedman, who asserted some of these. So let's look at some of those briefly, brief replies. So it says, uh, again, to the uh, allegation or the criticism that licensure prevents people from doing whatever they want to do. Well, the question is, do those people have the skills? They may think they do, but do they really? Are, can they possibly do harm? And my wife, just real quick anecdote, my wife um, has had a genital heart problem, a heart defect, and she had to have surgery. And so we look for a, the person, it was her decision, but we look for a person who was li a licensed physician, had special training, and in fact, certif certification to do heart surgery. Now, they weren't the cheapest person. But they were the person we thought had the most most likely to have the re required skills to treat her heart condition and for her to recover safely, which thank God she did. 
um, let, who's the least likely to do harm? So yes, there are some people who are prevented from doing what they want to do. Frankly, some people should be. Uh, if you've been in the field of behavior analysis very long, you probably know that there are people claiming to provide behavior analysis consultation who probably shouldn't be. Um, so second criticism, what are, uh, being licensure prevents people from with certain skills from using them. And again, the question comes back, do they really have the skills they claim to have? I've run into people who, uh, for whom that, that wasn't the case. They didn't have the skills. They just decided they did. And a few cases maybe, but the question is, are the skills that are relevant are the relevant skills assessed and required for licensure? Now, this is an important consideration is when you're putting together licensure for any profession, you need to make sure are the skills that we're talking about are, are the criteria really relevant for this profession? Um, you really need to be able to, to be clear on that um, and make sure that they are relevant. Uh, third criticism, that licensure restricts the supply of possible um, service providers in a profession, in a profession it limits the supply. And the answer is, yeah, it, it may. But then, as with my wife, didn't want just anybody to go in and cut into her chest and work on her heart, repair her heart. People, um, there may have been people that had the skills to do it, but they're not licensed. And my suggestion is, I hope that they can then get licensed if they really have the skills. But there's the point is, is the public protected? Is there, going back to the original criteria for licensure, are people being protected from harm? Um, and do these wannabes, if you will, really have the skills? Again, some may, but often they don't. Fourth criticism, what about this limits, licensure limits demand access to services of the public? Well, Again, we need to make sure, are the licensure requirements valid? Because we don't want to limit access to behavior analysis services um, any more than we have to, but we must make sure that the public is protected and that persons purporting to provide behavior analysis services actually have the skills they need. Um, to what extent? And so this, this, this is critical. Um, licensure increases the size of government. Well, it doesn't necessarily, there's some ways of doing licensure that it may not. Uh, have much, how, how much increase might there be? You know, you can do it poorly, you can do it badly. You can do it with a large, um, expensive, unnecessary um, bureaucracy, or you can do it efficiently. That's, I mean, you have to look at that. Um, and then is the greater good served? I mean, government exists to do certain things. One is protect the public, make sure certain services provided. Um, and so if there is some small increase in the size of government due to licensure requirements, uh, people hired to process licenses to do enforcement, um, does the end result uh, justify the expense? Sixth uh, criticism does uh, that licensure increases of a profession increases government regulation. And again, I think you have to ask, well, is this license just because I like to make law rules or is it in fact necessary for protecting the public? Is it efficient? And are the regulations valid? Those are critical things again, but if we, we must make sure that if in looking at licensure that for behavior analysts or any profession um, that we are sensitive to these possible criticisms and possible problems. So what difference does it does um, having different types of credentials make or does it make any difference? Well, let's consider what are some possible functions of professional credentials? Um, certification, just a certificate, registration, licensure. Well, what, what, what function might they be? We're, as behavior analysts, we like to talk a lot about function um, of behavior. So it lets people know you're, you're trained, maybe lets them know you're smart. Um, maybe it, people won't licensure because it'll help you make more money. Um, maybe because it lets people know your profession, you're a behavior analyst, you're not a, uh, um, a, a speech therapist. There's nothing wrong with being a speech therapist. That's just not who I am. Um, it lets people know that you have some minimal level of skills. Um, presumably that's what a professional credential is. And presumably one, one would hope it lets the public protect itself from people 
likely to do harm. But let's come back and emphasize that fifth one. It lets the public protect itself from people likely to do harm. And in my understanding of things and my view of the world, uh, that's the ultimate reason, the ultimate function of behavior analysis licensure. It is not just to protect the group, the profession of behavior analysis, but it's to protect the public. Uh, and that's our strongest argument for being able to um, address a lot of the criticisms that may come up to just licensure in general. So it lets the public be protected. That implies there's some enforceable sanctions for people who violate the rules or claim to have be a behavior analyst or licensed psychologist if they don't have uh, met the criteria. So let's let's look at some of the things. Just a quick comparison. Again, this is rough. It's not perfect, but just to look at what <clears throat> some of these different uh, four different types of cr professional credentials might do. What does it let people know that you're trained? Well, certificate, eh, maybe. It depends on what the certificate is. Registration, nah, maybe. You know, certification, yeah. It should let people know you have a certain kind of training as would licensure. Does it help you make more money uh, across the board? I don't know. It may be, maybe not. Um, does it let people know your profession? Um, having a certificate? No, it doesn't let people know your profession. Uh, many people who are not anywhere close to being behavior analysts have attended workshops I've presented and gotten a certificate. That doesn't make them a behavior analyst. Um, does registration mean your people know your profession? Well, I kind of got a weird answer there. Uh, maybe it depends um, on kind of what the uh, registration involves or who reg certification definitely lets people know your profession as does licensure does it let people know you have some minimal level of skills the certificate no doesn't just means you went to a workshop uh if that's all you got just certificate no not certification not a not licensure uh red, just being on a registry does it people know you have a certain level of skills maybe depends not it's pretty weak uh, certification and licensure, yes. If they're done the way they're supposed to be done, lets people know this person holding this credential has some minimal level of, of skills and competence to get on the, on this uh, this credential. And does the let public protect let the public protect itself? From people likely to do harm. Certificate, absolutely not. Registration, not. Certification, maybe. Some. Um, Often not, because like I said, people can lose their certification and still keep claiming to be a behavior analyst to keep whatever their claim is. And uh, if there's no licensure, unless they break the law, there's nothing much you can do about it, except public pressure. Licensure, yeah, it, it does. So let's look at this another way. Um, just kind of rotate it at 90 degrees, same information. So if you were looking at overall, uh, benefits of having just a certificate, not much. Registration, yeah, not much. <laughs> Certification, yeah, there's more there. Um, but one of the problems is over here on the um, the far, what is my right, your left column. Um, certification, does, does it let the public protect itself? Well, maybe to some extent, but ultimately most of the time in, in behavior analysis, this is the case, that certification basically, unless you break the law, um, you can just keep on doing it um, because there's no law saying people must doing behavior analysis have to have a, um, a license. Licensure, well, it's probably not gonna make you more money, okay, necessarily, but it does should, as far as we know, it should let people know you're trained. Maybe it lets them know you're smart. Who cares? Uh, does it let people know your profession? Yes, because you're a licensed psychologist, licensed physician, licensed behavior analyst. Um, does it let people know that you have some minimal level of skills? Yes, and let's be clear, certification and licensure both that specify minimal skills. It's not the ultimate level of skills that one needs in the profession. Uh, protect the public, yeah. Licensure is the best shot at that. Perfect, no but that's the best for protecting the public. So 
What difference does it make if you have skills or not? Well, again, a license, there are critical differences between license and certification. Certification is voluntary. It's not all that enforceable typically. Um, but as I've highlighted there, the fundamental difference between the two, between certification and licensure is that the is, is the issuer, uh, issuer of the certificate. Certifications are by non-governmental agencies like the BACB, um, very important, does good work. It's not a governmental agency. Licensure is awarded by some federal, state, regional, local government agency, or national in some cases. That's, and this is a critical take home. Licenses convey a legal authority to work in an occupation while certification on its own does not, okay? So that's very important when you're thinking in terms of protecting the public. So does the type of credential matter? I would argue, yes, it does. If your concern is protecting the public. If it's involved just to make more money, well, I don't know. So let's move on. Let's take a closer look in at our real interest, the licensure behavior analysts. So where to start? I, that's a question we are often asked on the uh, behavior analysis, uh, the ABAI licensing board. And let me point out, it's probably not a linear process. It's not like step one, step two, step three. It's a much more complex process. There's probably several sets of activities that can occur concurrently. And some start early, some start later. But I'm just going to lay out a variety of things. Please understand these don't necessarily occur in one, two, three sequence. So also keep in mind the general criticisms of occupational licensure that we reviewed earlier. That's uh, a few slides back. So where to start? Well, first of all, you need to be real clear. Why are you pursuing licensure? Or why might you pursue licensure? Is it to protect the public? Is it to build insurance? That's what I've heard some behavior analysts say. Well, we need licensure so we can build insurance. Well, in the US, that's a big deal. In other nations, not such a big deal. Um, so is a, we want licensure so that the uh, so that our profession is recognized, it gives us some status. Okay, that's nice. Um, I like that. But is that critical? But why why are we pursuing? What's the function? Um, is it to protect the public? And I think if you're going to take this perspective, which is the one I strongly advocate, uh, these others are okay. There's nothing wrong with them. But you really need to make sure what is your primary value, your primary. Uh, reinforce your most significant reinforcer for licensure. If you get it, what will it do? Is protecting the public, and you need to have be sure you have some examples of uh, why behavior analyst licensure is important. As we did here in Texas and other states and other nations, um, you need. To, sometimes people say, "Well, why? Nobody's ever been hurt doing by anyone doing this." The answer is yes, they have. And here's some examples. So if you know of some of those. Uh, you're going to pursue licensure, you need to have them written down. Obviously, you don't want to be careful. You don't libel or slander anybody, but have the information about things that have happened um, around you, near you, elsewhere in the, in the world. Um, are we pursuing licensure so we can make more money? Um, just be aware. Remember the earlier slide, it may not have that outcome. Uh, or is it to get the cool certificate to hang in your office? I mean, you know, that's nice. Um, Probably not real important ultimately. So uh, where to start? Why? Discover, be sure you're clear on why we're pursuing this. Another thing to consider where, in terms of where you start, what support is there among uh, for licensing behavior analysts among various groups? Is, what support is there among behavior analysts? Uh, in some jurisdictions, we found there's a big split in behavior analysts and the legislative body said, you guys need to work this out. We're not going to make this decision for you. Okay. So um, if you don't have some uh, inter-behavior analyst agreement, your, like your chances of success are gonna be reduced. Is there support for licensure among various behavior analysis organizations like ABAI, uh, affiliate chapters, uh, so on? Um, are there by ABA providers, do they support this? Um, companies or whatever, or clinics? And in some instances, people have uh, some very large and influential ABA providers have sometimes opposed some licensure efforts and that really made it more difficult. Is it supported by other professions, to speech pathologists, psychologists, do they support you or not? Uh, what about by consumers, the people who, to whom we provide services, do they support licensure behavior analysts? What about advocacy groups, rights groups? 
governmental entities, uh, various people in the legislature, department of min or ministries, what about by universities? These are all some people that you would hope would provide you some support. Know where your support is coming from. Why? Well, licensure. Who supports it? You need to also know, is there a core group of behavior analysts to lead the effort? Because typically it is an effort. Sometimes it requires years of work. Do you have behavior analysts who can be leaders in the licensure effort who have the time to do so? Who have the skills? There's a lot of skills involved here. Some interpersonal skills, negotiating skills. Do they have patience, creativity, flexibility, leadership? And I know those all don't sound very behavior analytic and we can go back and talk about the relevant repertoires, but for shorthand and time uh, purposes, let me just leave it at that. Do you have a core group of behavior analysts uh, who have the connections or know how to develop them? Do they have the financial resources? I mean, you, this is gonna cost some money very often. Do you need handouts? You need online and social media presence, uh, websites. Um, there may be some travel involved going to the government or talking to people to, um, about licensure. Are there training costs, training people how to advocate, uh, materials costs, postage, if people still mail stuff. Um, does this behavior analyst, group of behavior analysts, are they able to access relevant decision makers? Or are, are they all a bunch of pariahs that nobody will talk to? I mean, hope not, but you need to be able to, to be effective. You've got to be able to interact with people, got to have access to them. Where you start, you need to have connections with people. Uh, do you have connections with people with, um, with influence, lawmakers? You need a champion. This is one of the key things we have to tell people. Look, identify a champion, somebody who in the lawmaking process or regulation process who um, will really be a champion for your efforts and someone who has credibility and influence. Okay. So um, what about, do you have any connections with regulators who are the governmental entities that may regulate the profession? Do you have uh, <clears throat> connections with the chief government chief executives like the governor or uh, the minister? Uh, here in Texas, we passed the, the law for licensing of legis uh, behavior analysts, passed both houses of the Texas legislature, then went to the governor for signature. And he was, that year was kind of seemed to be on a, in, wanting to set a new record for bills that he vetoed. And we found out that our life, but he ran this licensure bill was one of the bills he was planning to veto. So fortunately, we knew people, behavior analysts knew people who knew people who knew someone in the governor's office that were able to connect with them. And fortunately, um, the governor signed our uh, licensure law. But these are important connections. Um, significant influencers, business leaders, advocates, families, lobbyists, um, a, a whole team of people that you need to have connections. Do you have the needed funds? Address that shortly. Do, to produce your materials, any handouts? Uh, sometimes if you're going to talk with government agents or, or uh, officials, you need to give them something saying why with your bullet points in there. Um, do you have, there may be registration fees you have to pay, online presence, uh, training cost public awareness materials, signs, buttons. Uh, a lot of times people have um, t-shirt or shirts or buttons they wear, um, signs they carry that uh, are promoting licensure behavior analysts. Uh, money for postage, travel, consulting costs. You might need, a, in some cases, you need a, lo uh, a lobbyist or a, a consultant. Got to be able to afford that. Whole different talk about how you get those money. But this is important before you get underway. Be, know what you need to know before you start. Why, connections, support, funds. So where do you start? Again, you got to decide what kind of act law you're going to have. You're going to uh, advocate for a title act or practice act. We've discussed those before or both. In most of the time, people go for both the uh, BACB. <clears throat> now, APBA model act is, incorporates both. And I think that's wise. So how's, how's, how's licensure going to be administered? You need to know where, what, what are you shooting for? What would this look like if you got it? Is it going to be by a government agency? Is it going to be a standalone board like a, the state of Louisiana um, has a freestanding uh, governmental entity? That's uh, the Behavior Analysis Licensure Board. In other places, it's different. Right? There's a regulatory board that is under another profession, such as in the state of Missouri. Uh, behavior analyst licensure is under the psychology licensure board. In this, 
uh, Commonwealth of Virginia, the state of Virginia here in the US, um, but he ran his licensures under the medical board, okay? Um, and then maybe it's under a big, a large umbrella agency of the government um, or some large commission. Like again, in Massachusetts, um, this is the case also here in my state, Texas. So in Massachusetts to illustrate, <clears throat> they, there is behavior analysts are licensed under the uh, Allied Mental Health and Human Services Professions Board. So there's behavior behavioral analysis. That's what they call it, not behavior analysis. That's the way the law was written. So under this board of behavior analysis, licensure, education, psychology, marriage and family therapy, mental health counseling, rehabilitation counseling. And each, there's one board and each, rep each profession is represented on that board. So this is kind of a moderately sized umbrella. But let's look at Texas, okay? Just for difference, a different organization altogether. Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation um, licenses 39 different professions. And you can see it's very diverse. Um, midwives, massage therapy, laser hair removal, which is uh, one that maybe I should look into. Um, driver's education, behavior analyst, okay? So there's a huge umbrella there, a government agency that has license, but under each of these, there is a separate board for each profession, okay? Which is different from in Massachusetts. And the behavior analysis board, which is as Wafa mentioned, is I'm the presiding officer of it. And there's behavior analyst on that. There's a um, licensed behavior analyst, licensed assistant behavior analyst. Uh, there's a physician um, and public members. And we make recommendations. They go to the commission, the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation Commission, and then they decide to accept them or not. They can't change them. In some states, it's different. But sometimes you got umbrella agencies. Which is better? It's hard to tell. Each one can be done well. Each can be done poorly. So are you going to have a government agency? Is it going to be standalone? Like, you know, there's pros and cons of that. It's nice. Nobody else but. Uh, sticking their nose in your business. On the other hand, it tends to be more more expensive, which can be a deterrent for people getting licensed. <clears throat> you can be under the licensure uh, a regulatory board of another profession, like in Missouri for their state of Missouri, where they're under psychology. Well, that's actually worked out pretty okay, I understand. Other instances, no, because you have someone who doesn't know behavior analysis trying to dic to supervise and oversee how behavior analysis is done. That can be very problematic. Have a large umbrella agency like in Massachusetts, like Texas, or moderate one like in Massachusetts. Um, there's some good things there. One of the things it does, I'll just mention this in the US, this is a very important thing because of a U United States Supreme Court decision that specifies how, you know, who's making decisions for whom? Is it more behavior analysts making decisions for behavior analysts? And if so, there's a concern they're just going to be taking care of their own profession, keeping it small so they can make more money. Or if it's set up in a dip, if the licensure is set up in a different way where someone who is not strictly a member of the profession ultimately makes a decision, there's in the US, there's some uh, protections there for uh, challenges. So, but if you don't have behavior analysts actually providing the input to the ultimate decision makers, that's a problem or can be. So, what role the behavior analyst is going to have in licensure? Okay, you need to decide that early on. Are we just going to be kind of watching? saying what's going on. Are we going to be advising the decision makers? Are we going to determine what regulations go into effect? Or are we going to do it all by ourselves? Um, I definitely say you don't want to be an advisor. I mean, a, an observer. Advisor is helpful. Being able to determine regulations, definitely you need to be in on that. Otherwise, people who know nothing about our, our profession can be making decisions for us that, in fact, harm the public. And that's the ultimate issue. And maybe it limit our access to practice our profession as we need to. And behavior analysts going it alone, that's dangerous, at least in the US, uh, that won't withstand much court challenge. So who's gonna be on the board? Is it gonna be behavior analyst only? What level? Um, gonna be some other qualifications like experience. Here in Texas, there are behavior analysts on the board, but they has to be have at least a minimum of five years experience um, before you can be on the board. Other professions like all of them going to be on the, from another profession, some part of them, just one, just two. Um, who's going to be providing, you know, they're going to be uh, staff from the board 
that issues licenses, are they going to be on it? Who's going to be on it? They're going to be public members. They're going to become some combination. But, but again, these are issues you need to decide. Can't give you a real, an answer. Um, that really depends a lot on where you are. So who drafts the law? The behavior analysts do it all. Say, here you go. Um, early years ago, I thought that's how we'd work. We're behavior analysts. We know what we do. We'll write a law, give it to the legislator, let them put it. It uh, doesn't work, typically speaking. You cut and paste from some model act. Uh, that can get you a lot of mileage. Just need to make sure that <clears throat> if you're using the APBA, BACB model act, that it, it reflects the, the governmental situation uh, and everything in, in social context where you are. Is you just going to have a bunch of lawmakers make the law up? That's, you know, if they do it by themselves, that's not maybe not good. Advocacy groups going to make it up, uh, write the licensure law, some combination. Just need to decide who do we think is going to write the law. Um, what do you get? You got to need to talk about what are going to be the qualifications for licensure? Is there going to be some examination that the, the local uh, <clears throat> pardon me, jurisdiction or entity or board is going to uh, use? Is it going to use some existing exam? Going to make up one? Believe me, this is expensive and difficult to do it right. Uh, what education requirements are we going to have? What experience requirements? Uh, what, what role is there going to be for uh, information from other um, other entities, like are you going to accept the BACB certification and that's all, or are you going to um, require something else? Uh, need to make sure that these criteria are valid. <laughs> Be aware of those possible criticisms of licensure <clears throat> and make sure that the certification procedures are appropriate. And that's one of the things the BACB has done really well is that they are a certified certifying entity. Uh, there's their criteria for licensure or for certification have been um, validated um, rigorously. And so that's something to consider. The problem now in nations other than the US is that the BACB doesn't issue new certifications there. So there's other entities coming on board. We just need to make sure that they, that their criteria for certification are really well validated and rigorous. Um, so where do you start? You need to have a ground game, all right? Now, what do I mean by a ground game? Okay, there's the, the uh, legendary Hall of Fame running back, Emmett Smith from the Dallas Cowboys who play not far from where I live. <clears throat> He's running the game. It's a ground game where you, ball, you move the ball by running it. I realize those of you who are not familiar with American football, this may be weird. Um, but you have people blocking for you. The guys wearing the same uniform have been blocked, trying to help him facilitate. The other guy with the black helmet, he's on the other side. He's trying to, he's an opponent. He's trying to stop you, but you've got to be able to advance your cause, sometimes in small steps, sometimes with against opposition, sometimes with um, a lot of work from a team of people. So you need to have a ground game. So you need to mobilize your members of your organization. You need, and there's a lot of things, specific things you need to do. You need to be have their contact information, understand no who, who uh, their constituencies. Who are they? You know who in the government do they connect to from their region? Uh, they need to be informed about the proposed bill. You need to provide training about effective advocacy. Um, everybody doesn't know how to do this well. It's a special repertoire. Believe me. You need to have your elevator speech ready. You need to have handouts. You need to have your procedures for update, keeping people updated on developments. This is your own members of your group or profession. You, know, you need to provide testimony committees uh, often. You need, somehow there needs to be somebody who's systematically coordinating these efforts. This is again, back to that notion of you've got to have a core group of behavior analysts and maybe a lobbyist or consultant who help you with this. Ground game, you need to know, mobilize your supporters because we've got typically got to have people other than just the behavior analyst group. It's often a relatively small group. In many nations, it's far fewer than in the U.S. In the U.S., we're still relatively small. <clears throat> but you need to get the, who are your supporters? You need to identify them. It could be clients, family members, advocacy groups. You need to solicit their support. You need to get them supporting you locally where you are, as well as at the central area or the, uh, the seat of government. Um, need to address their questions. They need to be prepared to deal with the opposition. They need their brief elevator speech, like what can, telling somebody in the time it takes to ride in the elevator, why behavior analyst licensure is important. You need your members to do that, also supporters. They need to have some handouts. They need to be ready for developments. They need to give testimony. In, in my experience, in several states, often the uh, input of 
consumers and supporters who are not behavior analysts themselves have been very effective in persuading lawmakers why licensure behavior analysts is important to protect their sons, their daughters, their family members um, from charlatans, frankly, and dangerous people. Our efforts need to be coordinated. So you need to, where to start, you need to identify likely opposition. Who's likely to oppose what you do? Other professions, sometimes psychology in the US, sometimes psychologists groups uh, support, sometimes they oppose, sometimes speech therapists oppose, sometimes they oppose, sometimes they support. Oc same with occupational therapy, so on. Advocacy groups, in the US, this is a big thing. Some advocacy groups um, strongly support behavior analyst licensure because they see the harm that is done by people that are not adequately trained. Um, Sometimes they have a misunderstanding of what behavior analysts do, think we're fascist or something and harm people and they oppose. You need, who are they going to be? Maybe it's from people with some theoretical um, <clears throat> uh, point of view or philosophical point of view that they are opposed to behaviorism or say they are. Often that means they don't understand it. Um, but they're opposed to the government getting too big. They're opposed to government regulation. Maybe they're just general libertarians. Um, You've got to be prepared, know who they are if you can, be prepared for uh, dealing effectively and graciously with their arguments, their opposition. There's anti-ABA uh, activists now. That's very evident here in the US sometimes. You've got to know who to look for. Um, then once you get a license, a law drafted, then what do you do? And the answer is more work. <laughs> Dr. Gordon, I absolutely love this. Just a reminder, we have about three more minutes. Excellent. Thank you. I'm almost home free. Uh, and more work. Once you get the law, uh, you know, drafted, you're ready to get it in, support it to someone uh, in the government. Then you got to put your ground game in action. You've got to monitor progress. I know that's what behavior analysts we do. Uh, we got to maintain contact with your champions. You got to support them. You don't want to lose them along the way. You've got to give testimony or whatever, or provide written testimony, whatever as, um, as, as needed. Expand, expand your ground game, bring more people into the effort. You got to monitor this all the way through to the last signature. Like I was talking about in Texas, we had to have the governor watched all the way through to make sure we got the governor to sign it because the governor didn't sign it, nothing. Participate in rulemaking. Once you get a law, usually then the way government works in the US and many places, then you have to write the rules to specific guidance. Behavior analysts need to get involved with that. If not, it can be a problem need to monitor. And then once you get licensure, a licensing entity set up for behavior analysis, got to stay engaged. You got to participate in, in getting that set up. Bottom line down at the bottom is you never stop monitoring and engaging in the licensure process. You can never say oh, it's done because sometimes there's changes in the rules and regulations. Some of those are good, We've done a lot, usually sometimes you have to go back and make some good changes. Some people can try to undermine licensure through that means. There may be changes in the statute, the, the law, especially watch for challenges to scope of practice. Be changes in the composition of the licensing entity. And then there's what's called sunset review, where they see, do we need this law anymore? So resources. The ABAI Licensing Committee, it's on the affiliate chapters page of the ABA website, APBA website, the ACB website. And there's my, you can email me there if you like. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. I've Thank you. So covered a lot fast. It was fast, but it was informative and you touched upon lots of important things that we have to do, especially uh, really questioning the why and what, what knowing what we need to do before we even start. So thank you so much. You honestly answered all the questions before I wanted to ask them. And um, I wanna thank everyone for attending as well. I will be posting the link for the survey. So please feel free to fill it up. And uh, yeah, you should now um, be, have, have access to the link. Thank you again, Dr. Borland for this informative talk. We truly appreciate your expertise and uh, the information that you provided. Appreciate Thank you for this. I, I am honored to have the opportunity to talk during this very first presentation, this historic event. I so appreciate uh, Lamas inviting me in WAPA. Um, and just to make sure you know, today's World Behavior Analysis Day, first ever. And we're so honored to fun. have you on this historic day, Dr. Borland. We really, really are honored. And thank you for accepting our invitation. And we hope that this will be the 
first of many, many conversations with you about legislation and certification, hopefully soon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you need to, want to contact me, either one of these folks have know how to get hold of me. So thank you. Again, I'm honored. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Borland. Yeah.